for, bio, and for environmentalists. Um, for us, it's really about um, utilizing brands and utilizing creators and innovators to really map the future. They really have the influence. They're trendsetters, the fashion industry, huge trendsetter, which leads us here to the surf community, the surf industry. I mean, there's pretty much no industry on this planet that's not such an authentic voice to protect the playground and um, protect the ocean. So for us, Parlay, um, from the ground level, was firmly committed to embracing the surf community, embracing the industry, um, partnering with uh, Surf Rider, Save the Waves, um, Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, all the great work uh, Hugo's doing at um, Surfers Against Sewage. So, for us, um, we really work to raise awareness for the beauty and the fragility of our oceans and collaborate on projects that end their destruction. And, um, you know, it's all about collaboration these days. Like, this problem is such a mess. Um, the old days of environmentalism, I mean, I come from the old days of Sea Shepherd, I met Paul Watson 16 years ago, ran around with him on a boat for uh, two or three years chasing illegal uh, whalers. And, and um, you know, activism's great, um, environmentalism's great, but at the same time, um, we're in it way too deep. So we really need brands, we really need governments, we really need innovation, we really need designers. So we, we sort of changed things right out of the gate. Sustainability to us was boring. We really wanted to empower innovation. So we, we, we really started focusing on eco-innovation. And we all start, also started focusing on marine plastic pollution. Um, you know, there's no body that can sit at the table, especially in this room, and argue that plastic is not our problem. It's found on every beach, every coastline, all around the world. I don't really have to sell this crowd on that. But in case I do, to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future.
come with me on a journey through the eye of beauty. Across an ocean of grief. And beyond. So, I don't know how many folks in this room have seen that before, but um, that was done by a good friend of ours, uh, Chris Jordan. Um, it's now a full uh, length movie, and I was able to sit with them for a few different nights at Album Film this year, and you know, he just stunned the audience there. It's probably the most captivating imagery which really showcases where we are. I mean, these albatross, they fly um, you know, for weeks out of a nest. Uh, across thousands of miles of ocean, um, looking for food. And this sea, this ocean, you know, used to give them so much, used to give them so much life and so much nourishment. And now, a lot of what they're finding is plastic. So they go back and regurgitate it to, her, to their young. And the interesting thing about this for me is it's so ironic because plastic is now found in so much of what we eat. And I think it's just a sign of the times. And, it's not just about the plastic on the beaches anymore, it's really about human survival. So, it's no longer about just saving the whale, it's about saving ourselves. So that um, leads us to really sort of what we do in our program is to look at ways to end marine plastic pollution. We came up with a strategy called AIR, and in simple terms it's avoid, intercept, redesign. So avoid plastic where you can, intercept it from coastlines, from communities, and redesign the material all together, which is really the end game here. Um, in the Maldives, you have uh, 1,192 islands, roughly stretching over about 960 kilometers um, of Indian Ocean. And these islands were once paradise until this showed up. So it was no longer the, the coconut leaf or you know, the, the stuff that, that normally could be dumped on the beach, it was all this wrapping and, um, and plastic product that um, had, had no place to go. Um, so we, we showed up there, I don't know, four years ago, I did, as a matter of fact, and met with the community, met with the government, uh, met with the United Nations, and um, just came up with an overall interception plan. And we started putting, um, well, there's, Greg and Ramon cleaning up a beach in the Maldives um, recently, but we started um, looking at ways to prevent a lot of this plastic from not only going into the ocean, which a lot of it was, but also going out to Trash Island, which is just a, basically a coral reef um, dumping ground. And so we start, started setting up these interception points um, in the capital city of Mali. You have about 180,000 people drinking three or four plastic water bottles a day, so you can do the math. And all of this plastic literally gets dumped on a boat for like six or seven boats each and every day and goes out to sea and I don't know, 60, 70 percent of it's going into the ocean. And we we put in the infrastructure uh, necessary um, and the equipment, the labor force, um, train the labor force, train the communities um, to work the equipment and we started bailing this stuff and putting it in containers and sending it to a, um, a partner of our facility in Taiwan. And um, we've been making uh, a textile yarn out of it. And this has been going on for quite some time. But the thing is, is this is, you know, really defines the purpose of the new luxury. Um, you know, these shoes are not really just a product. They're um, a true inspiration to the ocean. Um, you know, they, they, I think, carry a voice for not only plastic pollution, but illegal fishing, slave trade on the high seas all the stuff that the ocean faces and that we face. Um, and then that kind of brings us to sort of where we are going down the line, and, that, and that's really reinventing the material altogether. We'll call it the material revolution. And, you know, we can clean beaches all day long, we can recycle, we can do all this stuff, but there's just way too much of this material out there, way too much of it going into the ocean. And so for us, it's all about redefi redefining, redesigning materials that make sense and ending plastic altogether. Which leads me to um, 
this next discussion with these guys about what they're doing each in their own lives as well as their professional life um, dealing with this, this issue. And I'll lead off with Mr. Stover. Wait. I had some slides, but uh, I think we're going to keep it fireside. Um, and I think Guy left, but my slides were on Canva, so I was going to ask him for the premium version because we had a speed bump because we're a small company and uh, <laughs> we're on the uh, free software. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to share a couple thoughts from our side. Um, you know, our stories, we were kind of grew up as surfers and around the water. And you know, I was in the car last night with Hank Gaskell driving up. Uh, we were coming up from LA, and he was reflecting on the environmental concerns. And I think like the video that Mike just said, like the way that leaves a lot of people is that all these problems are so massive. Like, where do we start? You know, like, people feel overwhelmed about the issues, and it seems intimidating to think you can battle a petroleum company or deal with all these various problems that are facing the ocean. I think, um, you know, Sean and Guy's chat was, you know, really sobering, hopefully, for a lot of people. And great reminders of, like, how you start with tangible steps. And I, I think his, what he said about thinking locally and bringing it back to a local surf break is, you know, when we started our company five years ago, we used to always say, uh, you know, act small and dream big. Like, find a starting point and make a difference. And for us, uh, we were kind of just wanted to help out with the issue. And, you know, we looked at plastic pollution as, uh, you know, a problem that was like discarded fishing nets. Uh, we were given an opportunity by the government of Chile uh, in 2013 to set up a recycling program to work with fishermen to incentivize them through a community-based model where we would collect their material melt it down and put it into products. Uh, and I can tell you that in the five years of doing that, being focused on one type of material in one region, the amount of complications and issues that come up from that, it's, it's challenging to get the material from the, the basically the waste supply chain in the products. Um, and for us, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, focused on having our impact there and I will say that you know, getting to know the, the issue and, and looking back at the people making the material and where it's coming from. I mean, the most shocking thing is the volume. You know, you see these stats of how much plastic is out there, but until you actually start going to these ports and looking at how much is used on an annual basis just in one port, then you start to see, you know, how big of a problem this is globally. So in our first year, we collected about 10,000 kilograms in 2013. Uh, we're up to about 185,000 kilograms in year five, and we kind of have an internal goal to uh, to collect a million kilograms a year within the next five years. And kind of our business model has shifted. Um, our first product was a skateboard. A lot of people know us for that, but we've kind of, uh, you know, I think Hugo mentioned it this morning, the importance of going outside the surf industry. And, um, you know, we found that by creating innovative, innovative products like, like Mike talked about, you kind of have a voice and give people a platform to really engage. And, um, you know, so we're working on kind of large volume projects to move material now. And, you know, I, I think the biggest lesson that we've probably learned in the last year or two is that, um, you know, this doesn't just have to be about doing something good for the environment. I, I think the big sell to the big companies you're talking to and, and the big projects going on is that people really care about this stuff. and. You get a lot of consumers engaged that want to do something positive for the environment. And honestly, like in the surf, and the ski, and the skate industry, and all these industries, you have a really engaged group of consumers that really are sitting there waiting to help. And they, they're not always given opportunities. So giving them a platform to engage and do the right thing uh, is something that I think is really undervalued right now. I think companies really haven't um, figured out how much that can be worth. and. We certainly think that, uh, that that's the future and that it's, it's on consumers and companies to, to innovate better products, innovate better materials, but uh, innovate things that have solutions. And um, yeah, I, I think the last point uh, I'll say in that before we open up is uh, kind of looking at it, uh, we definitely encourage people to focus on kind of the traceability and transparency, not only of uh, the things that you make as a company, but the products that you buy. and. We're certainly our own worst critic now. I mean, we, we um, you know, we recycle, we create energy, 
uh, use energy to do that, and we're looking at ways in our supply chain where how do we support renewable energy so that we don't have to support fossil fuels? How do we, um, you know, how do we look at supporting the communities that we work in? Just going back that extra layer, and you know, as a company, as a consumer, I think it's really important that we all take a step back and look at those products that we can, that we can make and the products that we buy, where it comes from, uh, how it affects those communities, and, and how that product. Uh, benefits uh, the people and places around it. So, I don't know, the transition from there, I'll let, uh, let maybe Chris take it at this one. Yeah, so um, you guys are doing amazing work. I was really lucky to have a lunch with him and his partners early on, and they were, you know, the guys point super enthusiastic, like eight year olds in a candy store. And they were like, we're going to make skateboards out of fishing nets. And I was like, yeah, they, they completely sold me. And it was um, you know, a pretty big idea. And here they are, and they've been super successful. So good work. And um, keep that. <laughs> and it's just a great story. I mean, taking real waste is one of the worst, um, you know, worst offenders in the ocean and turning it into consumer products that are, you know, fun, engaging, and it's been, I think, really powerful just to see it and to see consumers react to it. And um, yeah, it's a great example of changing of the tides and seeing, you know, a cause-based product, the skateboard made out of fishing nets, which, you know, work pretty good. <laughs> But uh, the first one wasn't, it wasn't necessarily uh, as performance based as some of the competition. It was more expensive, but it did great because uh, people reacted to it, you know, the consumer reacted to it in a positive way. Um, I think we're all optimists, or we probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, another little just dose of optimism, um, somehow lucky enough to work with the Tompkins Conservation Group in Chile and Argentina. I don't know how I got that gig, but I um, <laughs> always feel lucky to be there, kind of like today, um, with a bunch of good people in the room. But um, just in the last couple of weeks, they've dedicated over 10 million acres in um, Chile with the Chilean government to into national park. So. Talk about incredibly audacious and ambitious dreaming to um, cook up that idea. <laughs> about 20 years ago, Doug Tompkins and a very small group of people, you know, had this insane idea to create this series of parks and began on that journey. And it was really a small group of people. So, um, you know, don't be scared to to think big, and there are some search spots actually in that <laughs> within that park, that series of parks. Um, you can probably find them, <laughs> but uh, there actually are some search spots, and it's actually segued into some marine protected areas as well. So there's just incredible groundswell, use that term from Sean, um, with the national parks rolling into these marine protected areas and. It's just nice to, to have a little bit of dose of optimism in the afternoon <laughs> after lunch. Um, I mean, all along the same lines of, of thinking big, I think it was said earlier today, if, the, if, you can, if your house is flooding and you turn off you know, the faucet or the pipe, fix the pipe, just throwing out kind of a big idea, but it would be incredible just to make Virgin plastic completely illegal, and you know, I challenge everyone here to, to work on that. And I think we have enough plastic in the environment now. I could be wrong, but I think there's more than enough to get us through, you know, <laughs> the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of in general. We open it up. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my name is Brian Cole, and I, I work with also people and planet and community. Um, so when we find those people, 
you know, of which we work with a number of, they tend to be environmental champions already, you know. One of our sort of tenets for, for working with athletes and adventurers and, and influencers is that they're people that first and foremost you'd actually want to sit down and have a beer with or go have a meal with or go get out in a surf with. And after that, they might be great athletes as well, but they're they're good humans. And, you know, we're really building a family. And I think by tapping into their influence as individuals to help share their messages and inspire people to think a little bit differently, either about the planet or about how they travel, um, you know, but, but nowhere along the line do, do any one of them profess to be the very best or purist or non-hypocritical. You know, in so many ways we can all look around, we're all, we're all hypocrites to a certain degree, right? So, um, you know, a big part of the revolution, I think, as it relates specifically to Cliff and, and the product itself, um, that I'll just touch on, it is our packaging, you know, and um, that's that's an Achilles heel for us at this point. It is a plastic wrapper, you know, and we've got TerraCycle bins here, and we're actually fortunately able to upcycle those into park benches and into bike racks and things that can be used for more sustainable measures, but it's something we're challenged by all the time as we use organic ingredients, we don't use preservatives, we have yet to find anything out there in the marketplace that will actually meet our standards to preserve the food to the degree that we need it to be so that you all and we all can enjoy a healthy product on the go. So that's something that we've looked at and we're, we're, you know, we're actively pursuing that. We're on the board of the Sustainable Packaging Council, um, working with other organizations to solve for that. And in the meantime, what we've done is we've reduced our impact in other ways. So for example, in 2002, you know, up until that point, you know, we started a sustainability program in 2001, which was already inherent to the organization, but we recognized the need to actually you know, make that more concrete. And in 2002, just by simply eliminating the shrink wrap that used to be on the packages, the box of clip bars, you know, that was a, a process whereby we could eliminate huge amounts of waste. Uh, reducing our package size, right? We didn't reduce the bar size, but just by reducing the, the package size, you know, by, uh, by about 10%, we were able to reduce the equivalent of a single wrapper in a box of bars. So taking those simple measures along the line, and I think sort of back to that, taking that simple step, that the recognition that each one of us has the power to take a step and the encouragement for anyone that we know to take that first step, which leads to the next step and the one after that, as we continue to all really try to evolve and, and, and do better with, you know, with everything that it is we're doing. So um, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's been the journey for Cliff and I really value personally at least that that's been my journey as well, um, coming from an ecology background, but then finding myself in a, in a, in a food company working with outdoor sport to um, to continue to stay true to the heart, stay true to those values, and just keep it going. And I think that's why we're all here, because we believe that by, by continuing to, to press on and to move in that direction, we can make a difference. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Cook. I'm with Reef. Um, we'd like to thank Mike, Nick, Chad for inviting me. Um, I was kind of a last minute guy. Um, originally, our head of marketing was going to be here, but uh, I'm really, really honored and humbled to be a part of this group. Um, my own personal journey here is just from being a country kid from Virginia. I grew up about an hour west of D.C., and, uh, you know, it, when you kind of grow up in that environment, you're already tuned to nature, you know, exploring the fields and the forests, and uh, I was like an ocean lover from a little grom, you know, the first time you put on the, the mask, you see that. That, that other universe down there, and you're pretty stoked on the ocean. I've always been an ocean lover. And then I grew up, kind of got into skateboarding, and skateboarding led me to surfing. And sort of surfing just changed my life. I also got into it kind of late. I didn't start surfing until seven years ago. I'm 45, so I kind of agree with Guy. It's like the later you start, the harder it is. But it was a radical life game changer for me. And uh, I always kind of wanted to do something creative with my life. You know, I'm kind of like weird right brain, left brain guy, like studied engineering, minored in art, had like my mom painted, and my grandma painted, and my aunts painted. That's how I was always drawing. And, um, you know, part of being here is about learning, just as much as it is talking story. Like, I've learned more in probably the first half day than I have in the last year on some of these issues. But it's gonna be really important for the corporations to change and to try and make it real huge BHAG-oriented goals to almost like reorient the entire capitalistic system, for lack of a better way to think about it. Um, we talked about this morning, 
is, you know, just the goal and the strive of capitalism is just more, 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 more in total shareholder value. And I think some of these bigger corporations now are realizing that there has to be more of a balance between making more stuff for profit and doing good in the world. So it, it is this sort of inflection point. And I'm proud of the work VF Corporation is doing. Like, it's like being purpose-led, making sure you understand your core values. And Reef's an ocean lover, you know, but we also have to look ourselves in the mirror and be like, oh crap, we make a lot of flip-flops each year and they're made out of plastic foam. So, you know, we're really intentional about trying to reinvent that material and that's why we're partnering with the Parlay and we're also partnered with Surfrider and we're working with some scientists out of UCSD that I think are probably closer than anyone I've talked to at reinventing plastic. Um, you know, this morning we talked a little bit about bioplastic. It might be really bad for packaging and single-use plastic and that kind of thing, but what we've learned through these UCSD people is that they're probably two or three years away from reinventing the type of foam that we could use in our flip-flops. And it's not going to be perfect initially, but even if it's only half polyol oil, which um, just quickly, the petroleum we dig out of the ground is just ancient algae oil that's been stuck down there a long time and the earth made it into this crude oil we dig up. When we dig it up and refine it, it puts 60% carbon into the atmosphere and that's that virtuous carbon cycle we used to have before we were adding to it um, is now been interrupted so the, the earth just can't process it. So we don't want to do that anymore. So you can take this algae oil and make all kinds of cool stuff from it. And it, but the science is just getting there, right, to a commercial grade uh, material. But that, that's something that personally really inspires me is this idea of like reinventing the material because then at least we're, we're starting to put less carbon out. We're, we're hopefully solving the ocean biodegradability problem. That's, that's the other one that they're looking at. Because I'll tell you, we see those pictures on the Maldives, there's flip-flops in those pictures. And it's super heartbreaking to me to just think about that and go, well, crap, you know, you could probably find a couple reef logos in there. Um, so that that's probably the BHAG we have is how do you reinvent the material and how do you partner with groups like Parley for the Oceans and Surfrider and these science-based groups that are hard, hard at work on cracking that code. Um, so anyway, just thank you guys for all being here and, being as inspiring, including my fellow panelists. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I have to leave tonight. I wish I could stay the rest of the time. Um, but I'll be sure to log in and check the notes and, and, and hopefully learn more from each and every one of you guys as well. Yeah, for, for us, the, um, the problem of marine plastic pollution is, is I mean, overwhelming. I mean, what, what we see around the world, and I mean, the stuff that our partners deal with um, each and every day. Um, but, you know, we, we choose projects and partners and, and programs that I think have high impact, but more importantly, there's such a strong voice. I mean, the relationship that we're building with small island developing states, 38 countries, these island communities that really, you know, live and breathe the ocean, it's, it's you know, their playground, it's everything that they do. Um, you know, they have, to me, I, I heard George today with the Ocean Conservancy pointing out Southeast Asia, you know, they rank way above um, any of these small other developing states as, you know, the heaviest polluters. So and that's where obviously the, the most impact can occur. But for us, it's really, for, for impact, it, it's that voice and, and that commitment and that influence to change. And I think, um, that's what the surf community and the surf industry has to really take on. I think that they need to champion this and you know utilize collaboration, utilize all of us. Um, and I, the last thing I wanted to say is um, the Global Wave Conference for us, um, first of all, we're super grateful to be here um, in this room with you guys. Um, the Global Wave Conference for us um, started in Cornwall and it really laid an incredible foundation for what we wanted to do. Um, we utilize 
our partners each and every day to influence major change that they don't even know about. Um, we're utilizing ambassadors in, in the surf community, professional athletes that are, we take into a room, man, and, and people just want to listen. And um, to me, that's pretty amazing to see. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks a lot. I think we're probably, Oh, yeah. Good idea. We'll open it up to you guys. Hey there, guys. Uh, Taylor Lane, industrial designer and creator of the Cigarette Surfboard. Um, first of all, thanks for showing up. Really awesome what all you guys are doing. So, kind of as a designer, you know, the ultimate problem here is consumption. Right? We're just consuming things at an unprecedented rate. Um, companies' job is to ultimately sell product so they can stay afloat. Um, so as the future beholds more people, projections for more plastic, less resources, how do companies um, combat this by saying that the goal is kind of less consumption or responsibility of products? Is it ultimately a circular economy? So how are you guys using those tools to kind of for the future, use better materials, but reduce consumption for the individual. Makes sense? Yeah, that's, an awesome, that's a great question. And I mean, essentially the whole environmental problem comes from the, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> uh, essentially, it is a finite planet, which I think we're sort of rapidly coming to the realization of as we see these sort of far corners of the world littered beyond you know our wildest dreams. Uh, before, you know, I think we, we thought that, you know, I think someone said earlier, throw it away. And it went somewhere. Now we're realizing, well it is a finite, you know, planet, unfortunate models kind of go. I mean I'm not great at math, but <laughs> there's not enough space for that. So yeah, I think it comes as sort of a push pull. I mean, consumers rewarding companies that are that are creating, you know, the business model more in line with the real demand is is one solution and um, a good business model, I think, and it's, it's being proven. And then regulation as well. We're seeing an EU with with plastic regulation coming into play, and I think that's going to accelerate undoubtedly. And um, you know, there are all sorts of different regulation I think is going to come into play and it needs to because we're clearly left for our own devices, it's it's not going to be good. Another sort of interesting concept to, to that point, there's a Harvard Business Review article um, talked by Von Schnard and Richard's way that sort of throws out this proposal that what if the product that does the least amount of harm to the environment is the cheapest and instead of the opposite, which is kind of what exists today. Yeah, and I was just going to add, um, you know, the whole capitalist thought, you know, is always looked at in a negative light, but Chris's point, I think, and his earlier point too about, you know, what if there was no virgin plastic period? And so from a capitalist standpoint, if the consumers and companies take on solutions, not just recycled plastic solutions, but natural material solutions, then, you know, that's capitalism for good. Like if those projects are the ones that replace existing products that are causing harm in the environment, then, you know, I think we have plenty of room to grow in that space. And from what we've seen, you know, if you look across the board at the numbers, uh, they're kind of hard to fathom how much plastic we produce every year. Like every single year it grows by um, a pace that is scary for a company and that's just more material in the environment. It was said earlier about how there's probably enough resources in the world um, to use now. And it's, it's something that, you know, as we get further in to look at our supply chains and where plastic is made, I mean, we were talking about earlier today, you know, even for companies to simply vocalize to their consumers and to people that work at those companies hey, plastics produced at a refinery, you know, as surfers and people that are in the environment, like, I mean, in California, like, I know for me, like, driving by, you know, the refinery in El Segundo and in Long Beach, like, those are eyesores for the coastline, and 
to think that you're buying a product or supporting those operations, like to flip that on its head um, and say that you'd be able to support applications that um, have a regenerative effect on the planet. And um, I think Patagonia is a perfect example of that. And we're certainly fortunate enough to be partnered with them and be a mentor and kind of have them to be a bit of a mentor and um, you know certainly a successful brand and one that's shown that you know consumers can make the right decisions and I, I think Chris's point's a great one about um, you know as the technology and the materials are developed you know the making the right decision doesn't always have to be at the cost of the consumer and um, you know growing those solutions and companies taking on uh, you know whether it's an algae-based foam that's going to be used across the footwear. I mean, I think that's the type of capitalism that will change because companies can't change if it has to be at the cost of the bottom line. But if it's something that they're threatened by and, and that they know that if they don't do it, they're going to miss a market opportunity, then that, I think that's when you really start to see uh, see the impact. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Rick Erkenef. I'm with the South Orange County Chapter of Surf Rider Foundation. Just a volunteer. Uh, realization that uh, you know consumption really is a problem. So it's great to hear there's some solutions. Um, just the other day, one of the uh, heroes of the San Clemente surf culture is on the world tour. Don't need to name names, but he um, turned in uh, 17 surfboards that he didn't even put wax on them. Um, so you talked a little bit about performance. Um, you know, there is such a high bar in the surf industry for a product, um, whether it's a pair of sh shoes for skateboarders, whether it's a skateboard, whether it's a surfboard. So, you know, how do we grapple with that as a surf industry, as a culture that wants to preserve um, what we have left and wants to leave something for the next generation, but still not sacrifice performance, like you said, with your packaging labels and such. So I'll just throw it out there to you guys. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. We talk about it all the time. I think we're pretty confident that, again, like to quote Matt Damon in that Martian movie, we're going to science this shit out of this. You know, we're going to have to. But pretty confident that the innovators on this, in the science and, and innovation community can crack the code. We're already looking at biofoams that are like 50% um, made from polyol that like for a flip-flop that we think just our gut tells us they're going to meet the need and then the other cool thing is like with our work with parley we still think that the actual raw material of, of petroleum-based plastic that's in the ecosystem is a massive problem so that's where these guys really come into play with this they're almost like a certification board for 100 percent ocean plastic recycle so getting that stuff and getting it into product and getting it out of the ocean is kind of an important like step as well. So it, it, it's sort of making sure that both can happen. And these these products that are like either the recycled or upcycled, um, you know, PET based, they're really they're pretty solid. Like, there's nothing wrong with those guys. Are we getting the Oscar music? The Oscar music. <laughs> uh, and I think it's also just all of us. Um, having that expectation of commitment by, um, you know, our partners. For Parlay, like Adidas, for example, um, they're getting rid of all um, virgin plastic in their supply chain in the next six years, I think, is what, what they committed to. So that's a huge step. In the first uh, six months of our partnership, they eliminated all um, plastic bags that put a sale as well. So, I, I mean, you know, it's it's these guys that are going to champion, you know, these other brands, and, and we're going to demand it. The consumer's going to demand it. So these guys don't have a choice, um, and you know it's it's really again though up to us to start redefining the material altogether. Um, the, the, the con I mean, yeah, you can reduce consumption, you can recycle all day long, but this material is having a devastating effect on us and and, um, and the ocean. So anyway, are we good. Yeah. Yeah.